doesn't play in very much. So again, this is a real signal, and again, it's very easy to do, so the particle is rotating, circularly polarized particle, and, and, and I measure the signal. Okay, and so we can characterize the, the whatever is happening in that, so I take different type, different sizes of butt rate. We are clever enough to be able to produce them in different sizes. Not me, but my students. And, and so the difference between two refractive indices in uh, the biofringency in butterite crystal is very large, it's 0.1. And theoretically, when it's large crystal. And then we have this kakapo of building them in the lab in colloidal solutions, and we have this nicely looking crystals which I showed you before. And uh, the butterite fibers that was measured by some other guy, the, uh, the difference between in the refractive index 0.087. So it's almost as crystalline butterite. And ours are, you can't see it here, 0.06. So this is pretty surprising for any material scientist, but I'm lazy to see. So I just accept it and work with it because I can. So here is the example. Okay, so this is my round particle. It's not perfectly round because we wanted to show you how it rotates. And you can see that it rotates very quickly. And that was certainly polarized one light in one direction. And now I change it to the opposite direction and it goes up. And as I told you in the introduction, I can rotate them up to 500 times. Well, 500 times. So it's not there. Okay, and we can see that the method is pretty good. So what we do, we measure viscosity first of water. So here I think we said that we measured viscosity of water and it was within 3% of the, of the value we break that. Okay, and then I'll just show you just one more. It doesn't want to go, it wants to break. Just one more. And this is we look, put it into glycerol solution and check it again. Uh, against the values from the handbook, and you can see that this is pretty good. And now I take the questions. Yeah. No, I didn't. Okay. Um, so can you Ah, very good question. I'll show you at the very end. Not that sticky. Because my tweezers, so my tweezers are coming like this, and here's the part, which means that the circularly polarized light is like this, so I can only spin it like this. I cannot spin it like that. In order to spin it like this, I have to come with tweezers like so. Which is not impossible. With clever nano-optics, it's not impossible. More questions? I'm only not that tired yet. <laughs> yeah. In case the particle is not by present, then how we can rotate it? I will talk about it after the break. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. How do you do particles wash molecules? Can you do a manipulation of very small? Okay, thanks. So you can, you can easily trap things down to 200 nanometers, but people have been trapping particles which are <laughs> metallic particles of the order of few nanometers. And only metal. Now, in principle, uh, so the force is going, uh, going down very rapidly because they are proportional to 8 to the third. So when the size is going down, the forces are very small, so it's very difficult to travel. But in principle, what you do in case of single molecules, which people have done, is to attach them to bigger beads. And then you look, so for example, you can use optical tweezers to look at the motility of a cell or uh, molecular motors. So you can take a single molecular motor, attach it to to bigger entity like a crystal, and, or crystal if you want to rotate it, depending on how the motor works, or to linear optical tweezers and measure that itself. Okay. But in, in principle, you should be able to track a single motor. Are there more questions? If not, let us thank the speaker.
and this is us physicists trying to make an attempt to be biologists. And uh, what we want to show here is that we can engulf those particles into the cells and measure viscosity within the cell. So you might have seen, so what we have here is basically my particle, which is perfectly round, and it's in a liposome, so it's an artificial cell. Um, and I can rotate this particle within the cell, and I can then measure the viscosity within the cell. So this is just another example of the same technique, and then I can measure the changes in polarization and so on, and determine viscosity of the cell, which we have done in this PIO paper from 2004. And then you can play games and have a lot of particles in the cell, and then um, you can rotate them and, and play games, but we won't. Okay, and as I said, the aim of the game eventually was to be able to have optically driven micro machine, and here is one optically driven micro machine which we constructed, which is very simple. So basically, I have a particle rotating; it's moving the liquid, and then obviously the particle which is near it will also move, and then it will be drawn in, and then you will have a combined machine. It's not a very sophisticated machine, but it's a very fast. Okay, and then you can start playing trips. You can start trying to, to get particles following a specific uh, roadmap that you design for them. So what we have done here is basically we have two rotating particles in double twists. One is rotating one way, one is rotating the other way. And this particle was very far away, but the liquid movement will be produced in such a way that it draws the particle inside. And if you get clever, and you bring many rotating particles in a row, you know, you have many tweezers this way and that way, you can lead the particle, the, this one, this little fellow, through the channel between them, and you can build microfluidic devices this way. So this is another day. And our friends in the lab in Glasgow have actually built a machine like that, and what they had is pretty much a channel, and with two rotating particles, and you can follow the color, the water, the liquid which was going through, and you can see, that this particular particles rotate in opposite sense, and then the water is being drawn through them. So you've got yourself a little water. Okay, so what else can you do with it? Uh, we believe it's really a rather nice tool because here on the left, on the left, I have a tiny amount of uh, eye liquid, uh, eye fluid, which is uh, under the microscope, and I put a particle into it and I basically rotate it in that liquid. You can see now that the particle is rotating. And then I can measure viscosity of the, of the eye liquid and, um, and so on. And the biggest thing in it is that you only need like femtoliters of solution to be able to do it. So it's very good. And here we combine tweezers and scissors. And so what we basically have is a cell and it has a little black sticking out of it. So it's a part of the cell which is filled with liquid and I drill a hole with blue laser and I put my rotating particle trapped in optical tweezers inside that lab and I rotate it and then I can determine the viscosity of the liquid around in, in the membrane of the cell. And that can be done, done quantitatively. So this is intercellular fluid which can be probed using optical tweezers. Okay, and another thing which we have done which is quite interesting is that um, we collaborated with a group in Irvine, in California, uh, where they were interested in looking at the transfection of signals within the cell. And so what they did is that they published a very nice paper in Science and uh, Nature about it. They nudged the, the cell linearly, and they looked at the transduction of the signal through the cell. And then we said, you know, in the, in the situations such as blood flows through um, and through the um, arteries and so on, there is a lot of talk about the influence of, of, the, of the turbulent flows with the stress being built around the arteries. So you want to ex, uh, expose the uh, wall of the artery to a uh, shear stress and see how the, how the signal is translated there. So what we did here is that there is a cell which is sort of flat on the microscope slide and then we bring our rotating particle into it, and if you are quick, you will say what, see what the cell is doing. No, we are not quick here, because I have to go here. So what happens is that the particles actually 
rotating and the cell reacts to it. I'll do it again. The particle is um, reacting to it, but uh, the cell is reacting to itself away from the rotating particle. So it's trying to, trying to, uh, I show it again and you look carefully. You cannot see the rotating particle, but you can see that the cell is retracting from the place where the rotating particle was. And, and that can be done again qualitatively, quantitatively, you couldn't see. Okay, let me describe what's happening instead. Um, don't worry about it, Ivan. Um, I'll go back. So basically what we were able to measure is that as soon as I rotate this particle, all this structure retracts, moves to the right. And then you can measure how much it is. And as soon as you stop, it goes back again to its original position. So now you can combine it with fluorescence, fret, and whatever methods, and study also how the signal is transducted to the nucleus of the cell. Okay. And another application is that you can take, remember we were talking about, um, about um, functionalizing my beads, and I can functionalize them, I can attach them to DNA on one side and attach them to the color glass on the other side, and then I can start spinning them and see how much torque I need to uncoil the double helix. Um, so we are still to do that. And measure the elasticity. Okay, so that's the end of um, um, beams carrying spin angular. But I also told you, and somebody asked that question just before the break, what happens if the particles are not bifringent? Okay, stop, forget bifringent particles for a moment. So now I want to use orbital angular momentum to other than bifringent particles. So what is orbital angular momentum and how can I create it? You know that I have Gaussian beam and it can be linearly polarized or it can be circularly polarized. But if I create helical wave fronts, which look like this, they have, they are called optical vortices, or singular beams, or gauss laguerre beams of light, with the charge L here. And what is specific for them is that the picture that I showed you before, that they have the, the pointing vector is like a spiral, okay? And it has certain angle, depending on what sort of uh, charge the, uh, the beam has. And so, depending how I produce this beam, it will carry different amounts of orbital angular momentum. So this is how the beam looks like, uh, and it will always have angular momentum, which is integer number times h bar per photon. So this is depicting here gauss laguerre beam of light, which is, has charge 1. Okay, so this is very simple here. And this is a phase singularity on axis, and a dark spot in the middle, and this generated, or can be generated by a laser or face plate or hologram. So there are many methods in which you can produce beams which look like this. So this is how they look in far field. So there is a phase singularity in this case of 2 pi in the middle. <coughs> and there is that spot in the test. And ring of light around it. And it can be linearly polarized and it can be circularly polarized. So if it's circularly polarized, it can have another h bar of angular momentum or one less of angular momentum. Okay, so this helical fronts look like this. So if I if I make them to cross <coughs> like equal to three, so this is slightly more complicated spiral, and this is basically what happens that we have the at the um, orbital angular momentum is just r times p. Okay, uh, let's skip this. This is the theory of it, but we skip that. So basically, I can produce them uh, looking very different. So this is Gauss Lagier 00, zero Gauss Lagier 01, zero 02, zero 03, zero 10, zero, etc., etc. I'm not interested in this in this ones because they're just a little bit more difficult. Other people in traffic are interested in them. I'll skip those. So I just use those. And what you can see is that it's 00, zero it's Gauss, like the Gaussian mode. Zero one has a little spot in the middle. As the charge is growing, the spot in the middle is getting bigger and bigger. And the ring of light is getting smaller and smaller, or narrower and narrower. Okay, so L not equal zero gives me helical wave front. Uh, angular momentum, I can most have L, H, bar, and photon, we said. And phase singularity is on axis and it's a dark spot. So it looks like a donut beam. 
And as we said, it can be generated by lasers and other uh, things. So what we do is that we can generate all the gamut of those, of those uh, laser beams. And as I said, if we take gauss Lavier 050, it will carry 50 times h bar of angular momentum of bar, or to angular momentum of bar. However, the ring of light will be very, very narrow, and the spot in the middle will be rather large. Okay, so um, I'll show you an example of what, what sort of games you can play. This is from um, the David Greer's lab, and um, let me see whether it will start. It doesn't start. So here we have two gauss Lagier beams. This is 60, and this is minus 30. So the sense of rotation is in opposite direction. So if I were to put any particles into circumference of these rings, they should ro rotate in opposite direction. So let us see whether they will do that. And here we go. So this is pretty impressive. So uh, this looks fun, but it can be used for a lot of very interesting measurements. So basically, uh, we can have, we can sort particles by size. Uh, somebody asked about sorting. We can sort particle by size using this sort of methods, and people have done that. Uh, you can study colloidal solutions and forces between particles depending on the distances between them very, very carefully, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so when a single particle interacts with the whole beam, it experiences a talk about the beam axis. So what do we do? First of all, we produce this funny thing here. It's a hologram, which allows us to produce gas like the so on. So this is done with computer-generated holograms, and then we have a, a, a holographic plate with very thick emulsion on it, which has very large resolution, and we produce this hologram. It looks like a dislocation, and depending on the size of this dislocation, how many forks we have in the middle, we'll have different gauss beams of light. So this one is charge three. So this one carries, so this is fork with three teeth, and it carries three h bar angular momentum per photon. So, what I do is that I put it into my laser beam, so all of a sudden, instead of so from the laser uh, beam here being Gaussian, what I now do is I change it because I put it up through the space hologram. So here comes the beam, which has space singularity in the middle. Okay? And then it's normal setup of optical tweezers that you can see here, and um, I can then change the sense of, uh, I can add circularly polarized make it a circularly polarized beam or let it leave it linearly polarized. Okay, so I don't know whether you can see this, but this is gas like a 0, 3 absorbing particle here. So this is just a fluff of the stuff from a uh, laser printer basically. And uh, we can rotate it. This is absorbing particles. So the beam upon being absorbing transfers orbital angular momentum and the particle is rotated. Super. So now your question is answered. I can have black particles and rotate them. Of no use to us whatsoever, simply because if I want them to rotate very fast, and they didn't here, what, what it means is that I have to put more power into it. And if I put more power, there's more heating, and they basically explode. So this is optically driven exploder rather than optically driven micro machine, but it proves the principle anyway. So. In absorbing particles, we have energy converted to heating, momentum pressed against the slide, so it's two-dimensionally trapped, and under the momentum, we will make it rotate. So, um, rotating absorbing particle, what we have shown is because our, again, our uh, PRL would want to believe us, and uh, because they thought it was just a propeller effect rather than, than anything else, what we are showing here is that we are rotating this useless absorbing particle with orbital angular momentum. And then what I do is that I add one h bar per photon to it by making it not only having orbital angular momentum, but also having spin. So I put lambda on four plane, I make it a beam with orbital angular momentum and spin in the same direction. And then, so it speeds up by one third because it was three h bar per photon before. So there will be four h bar, and then I pan the lambda of the four plate 90 degrees counterclockwise. So then 
the, the orbital angular momentum goes one way and spin angular momentum goes the other way, so it should slow down and it does. So this is transfer of both spin and angular momentum of line. Okay. And uh, total angular momentum, of course, is orbital and spin. And so together I should have four or, uh, or two. Okay, and as I said, it's not useful for anything apart from beautiful paper in Tiara of Nature, which we did, and, uh, and that's it. But it's uh, not of any use for optically driven micro-machines. But what we can do instead is that I can use the same type of beam and take elongated particle line. So this is two beads stuck together, so that looks like a rod, and now I put it into this Tausler beam of light, and it's, it's spinning very fast using orbital angular momentum of light. So it works pretty well. Okay, and uh, then you can take four of them. So here we are spinning four particles. And it is in gauss like a zero 4 beam. And uh, we can analyze. So, so, the, so the game here was, what we wanted to do here is to actually monitor how much orbital angular momentum we are transferring to the particle. So basically measure orbital angular momentum. This is pretty difficult um, to measure it uh, uh, with uh, quite high accuracy. So we're asking how to do it. Uh, and is it useful for driving optically driven micro machines? So we can also have orbital angular momentum in non axisymmetric objects. So this avoids needs for biofringence, as I said, uh, and it has high angular momentum flux availability, and better, of course, the shape biofringence. So I don't know whether you know what shape biofringence is. Shape biofringence is if something is elongated, so the dipole optical, uh, sorry, uh, electrical dipole is slightly different in the two directions, and that gives it something like shape biofringence, so that so the reaction to the electrical electromagnetic field will be different in both directions. And that expresses itself as shape by functions. And then what we also can do is to produce our specially shaped objects by using two-photon photopolymerization. And it's basically because it's convenient and it's high optical, optical quality. And, and I can have sub lambda resolution uh, for those particular objects. So, I can now use Gaussian beams, Gauss-Laguerre beams of light, and now I want to have optically driven micro machines as I want to produce them to my liking, not necessarily spherical. Okay, so this is my probe I want to produce, and people have done it before us, of course, um, and this is a picture from Paul Olmos' uh, lab, Oops. where what he did is these structures are produced photon photopolymerization process, which I will take you through because it's really lovely. And basically you can see that on this side, he has two cogs which, um, which are coupled to each other. So it's real optically driven machine. And it rotates. It is not three-dimensional trap tower. It's, it's sort of lying on the surface a little bit. So it slows it down and you can see that this machine is not particularly fast. So how do I um, produce micro-machine elements for rotation and, as I said, can I use the Gaussian beam without them being biofringent? And can I measure angular momentum? Again, this was the question which we left unanswered. And how can I uh, maximize the, optimize the transfer of angular momentum? So the more transfer of angular momentum I want to have, how do I do it? How do I create my machines to do that? So this business about optically driven micro-machines is all uh, people have been trying, not optically, but micro machines is all. So these are MEMS, which are produced in Sandia. And um, I don't have this picture, but the, but the cogs are here so small that you put a mite on it. And there is a picture on the website of a mite on top of this machine. The mite looks few minus, and the machines look really high. However, they are about 100 microns to, to 500 microns in size. And this is our micro machine. So this is a, a, a stalk of the machine and a cog around it. And you can see that all this structure is only about eight microns in size. And this is produced using 
two photons for the polymerization process. So what do I do? So basically, I take a femtosecond laser, and um, here I give you a comparison between normal one photon fluorescence and two photon, or one photon absorption and two photon absorption. So what happens in the process is that I have my ground state of a system which I'm illuminating with molecule or whatever, an excited state, and of course I can absorb certain wavelengths of light which is resonant with the system. So in fact what we have here is green fluorescent protein. And um, if it is, if we tune the laser to uh, resonant transition, we can see this is the microscope slide and you can see that along the entire microscope slide I'm seeing the fluorescence. So there's a fluorescence occurring here and a lot of scattered light around. Light. If I, however, use two photon process whereby I lump two photons on top of each other energy wise, then I go from red photon, two red photons are absorbed, but the process which we are looking at, which is emission, is in a blue region of light. Right? So take, for example, 2780, right? So that gives me, in two photon absorption, the emission, it gives me uh, 780 divided by 2. And you can calculate how much it is. And you can see the spot here. So the big thing is that I'm using a, a, a microscope here with very high numerical aperture uh, uh, objective. And uh, so I'm focusing the light to tiny spot as I did before. But this process, is intensity dependent to the square rather than uh, uh, just proportional to the test. So therefore, the process will, uh, will only occur at the very uh, uh, focal spot of the laser light. So the, you can see the fluorescence only in this little spot rather than along the whole line. Okay? So that's what I want to do. So how can we use it? We take a resin that reacts, that is actually uh, photopolymerized by blue light. And, and I take uh, red light and I do two photon absorption in that resin. And then I have a clever program which makes a, a, a scan, three dimensional scan of the object that I want to produce. And then I scan my laser beam and wherever it's at the places where I want the thing to occur, the laser is on, and when it passes that place, the laser is off. And I scan it in the X, Y, and Z direction. And this is what very clever group in Japan, long time ago, was able to produce. And you can see that this ball is very little and has incredible details on it. Okay, so the question is, can we do that? So the setup looks something like this. So I say, take my femtosecond laser, one of those you saw today in the lab here, and I take a, a neutral density filter only just to be able to, to, to uh, have control over the intensity of my tsunami. And then uh, on the stage I have my resin, which I want to photopolymerize, so there's a normal, uh, it's a NY80, so this is a glue which is normally used to glue lenses together, uh, which is sensitive to UV light. So normally when you glue lenses, you put two parts of the lens together and you expose them to UV light and then it's all transparent and beautiful and it matches the refractive index of the, of the rest of the lens. So basically we have this resin here and wherever the laser light hits it, it photopolymerizes. In all other places it doesn't. Okay, and then I watch it and how it looks like. So here is my cob which I want to produce. So here is my uh, light coming through the lens, and then I move it, this is the resin here, and I move it in X, Y, Z in controlled way. And the pattern looks something like this. Now this is the production. And you can start guessing what we are producing. Can you see anything coming up? Very little. Is it kangaroo? It is a kangaroo. How could I come from Australia without a kangaroo? <laughs> So that's a kangaroo, and if you want to see how he looks like, this was the ready-made kangaroo. I wasn't particularly satisfied with it. What I wanted my student to do is a hopping kangaroo, three-dimensional hopping kangaroo. We're working on it, but we have other bits and pieces down here. Okay, so how do we do it? So this is the, this is the, <coughs> the idea. So 
I program my uh, computer in such a way that I'm building from bottom up, I'm building layer by layer. So I'm building a store, and then so this is <coughs> this is an um, offset cross, an offset cross at least because I want to be able to move it in um, <coughs> in Gaussian beam because I need it not to be uh, symmetric. <coughs> and then it's on the stalk and there is a cross on top of it. So I build it layer by layer. So the stalk, the, the cross, and the rest of the stalk. And this is the fabrication process of real stuff rather than kangaroo. And I think that we should be able to see this one a little bit better. OK? <coughs> so we have very precise stage. We are moving the stage, and you can see that there are these fellows already built, and there is one being built right here. And it actually sped up quite a lot for you to be able to watch it because it takes about 15 minutes to build one. We are doing it a little bit faster, but you can see the structure being built here. So you can do it in a very reproducible way. It's very cumbersome, but you can do it. And they are sitting on the microscope slide, so those whole process are sitting on the microscope slide, and when I need them, I kick them off and I use them. Okay, so this is how they look. So this is what we plan to do. This is how it looks in scanning electron microscope. You can see the sizes of it, so you can see almost the layers being built. <coughs> so this is offset cross. And uh, res let us look at the resolution of two photon photopolymerization process. And it is due to the nonlinearity of the process resolution beyond the diffraction limitation. It is given by the smallest polymerized voxel size. And this is how it looks. So this is my voxel, so, so the resolution is about 200 nanometers. And then if I'm clever and I'm, I'm overlapping the layers with which I build my photopolymerized structure, I can get this nicely looking ball, which we haven't succeeded to do, but we do other nice things. Okay, and then what you can say, okay, now I want to rotate it in my laser tweezers and measure the torque, or optically. So what I do, I simulate here the drag torque. So this is a calculation we've made, and you can see how the drag torque should look like. So this is all computer simulations. And here, I'm rotating. This is one of those structures, and what we are showing here is the edge uh, of, a, of a glass, so we want to show that it's actually uh, three-dimensionally trapped. <coughs> and so we produce machine to our liking, this one being, uh, 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 this is not offset cross, but normal cross, so we are rotating it in gauss like beam online, and you can see that it's rotating. It's not rotating very, very fast, but on the other hand, I can increase laser power with which I'm illuminating it, and I can rotate it pretty fast. So that's optically driven micro machine, and <coughs> and this is rotating offset cross. No, it doesn't want to go. No, okay, we'll skip that. Okay, so the, so the dream would be that you could produce structures. <laughs> on the microscope slide, that if you want to give optical laser tweezers to people who are actually not used to using them, because they are from different fields and they want to use it for something else, but they want to have capacity of using <coughs> Gaussian beams and using it also with Gauss-Lagel beams, you would want to present them with the methodology in which <coughs> they can start with Gaussian beams and not need any holograms to produce cast the gay of lights, but produce it all in one go. Okay? So what I want to do is that I want to produce structures which will change Gaussian beam to Gauss the gay beam of light under my microscope in the focus box. So here I'm showing you <coughs> how we can do that. So basically we go back, I have my uh, my um, um, photopolymerization system here, okay, and after I produce my structures, I will turn on another system which will allow me tracking, and I will only use high sapphire laser for 
for photopolymerization. And, and then I will use 1064 laser for traffic. And so what I have to produce is somehow be able to produce hologram under the microscope. Okay, so I want to produce, remember my four, which I was showing you, which will give me gauss Lagier zero three beam of light. If I now, oops, sorry, go back. If I now program my computer to such, in such a way that in this resin on the top of the glass side, I produce hologram uh, a structure which looks like this, um, which if added the layers together will give me, in the transmitted light, will need to give me gauss Laguerre beam. So I build this uh, structure by structure. Then if I combine that with optical tweezers, then I can have a structure which normally wouldn't be trackable in gauss Gaussian beam, and now because I have gauss Laguerre beam, and I bring this fabricated optical microelement on top of the thing that I want to rotate, now all of the sudden rotation will be possible. So let us look at that. This is the structure I want to have because this is similar to on-axis hologram that I was showing you before, like the fork I was showing you. So I can decide how many wings this thing should have, how thick it should be, and then program my computer to produce it in femtosecond laser photopolymerization to photopolymerization. And I can then produce macro optical diffraction element. And we do that, and this is the produced element in optical microscope, and this is in scanning electron microscope. So you can see that it still can, you can see the layers, and it's not perfect, but it might does the work. So, um, so if I now, what I'm showing you here is that if I now take TM00, which is Gauss, Gauss in beam, I put it onto my face hologram, the light which is transmitted by that face hologram which I just produced, will be have helical wavefront of certain sort. So in this case, with this eight wings, we'll have gauss Laguerre 0, 04. So that means that the light which is illuminating any structure under the microscope is now pairing 4 h bar orbital angular momentum platform. So here it is. So now, if I have this structure, which can be put on top of some optically trapped element, which is a cross. Then what I can do is, if I combine the two, then it means that here, before this one, I have normal Gaussian beam. I, I have this structure on the microscope slide. I bring that structure on top of that, and the whole shebang should rotate. So this thing now is rotated with very easy beam. Again, you can look at the computational fluid dynamics code and see how the field of rotation should look like, and we've done that. And then we can do the rotation. So what I will do now, so this is optically driven sorter, and I will show you why it can be a sorter. So basically my light is coming from below. Then I, I'm changing this Gauss, Gaussian beam to be gauss Laguerre beam of light with the with four H bar per photon of orbital angular momentum. It illuminates my cross and the cross rotates. And here it is. So here is the the structure, here is the cross. Sorry for sort of how the picture looks like, but this is on the uh, uh, normal optical microscope. And then what we do is that we bring that structure on top of the cog, and you can see that the cog is spinning. And you can see that it can spin it very, very fast. And of course, with the methodology which we had before, by looking at the transmitted light, and you can see that as soon as you move it away, this cog was still trapped, but it didn't rotate in Gaussian beam. So this answers your question perfectly, how you can uh, get the rotation. Uh, we can stop.
uh, questions, please. Yeah. Actually, in, in case of helical difference, we come across with a term like fractional charge. Say it again. Fractional charge. Can you have fractional charge? Yeah. Uh, you can construct any beams like that, but why would you? No, I mean, uh, in case angular momentum is always an integral value. Yeah. But uh, how fractional charge means how topological charge could have a point value also. Yeah, uh, I don't know that it's actually possible to do. I cannot answer that, but I don't think it's possible to have much Okay, thank you. More questions? Um, sorry, and if the particle is magnet made of magnetic or ferroelectric materials, can its properties, its rotational properties, uh, be um, dependent on the external field, electrical or magnetic? Yes, they can, absolutely. But these are the electric part. These are the electric materials. So I mean, there are rotating magnetic tweezers. People do it a lot. Yeah. With the field. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Questions? Typically, if you don't make this W a Gaussian beam, you have to dissipate all of them before the object. So you put it after the object. So I'm just. I'm just wondering how far you put your Well, whatever. normally, so in this case, in this case, I'm illuminating the whole thing with Gaussian beam. And this hologram is micro hologram, which is sitting on microscope slide. Yeah. Right. Okay. But you have to make your beam go through. Save side. Right? Uh, save size. Very good right, question. Right. Very right. good question. Okay. So what I do here, I'm not actually saying that I have maximized the efficiency of the process. What I have here, I'm not quite sure how big my beam is. I think my beam is slightly smaller than the optical element. And you are absolutely right that in order to make it the most efficient you can make it, you have to work on the thickness of it and also on the size of the beam. That's right. So, the so, numerical aperture in this thing was 1.4. Because your object and your hologram are close to each other. They are not very far right, from right. each other. So, I'm just assuming. The depth, of, the depth of field is not big. I mean, it's, it's very high numerical right, aperture. Right. So, we have done it with numerical aperture of 1.4. We have done it with slightly lower numerical right. aperture. Yeah. I always thought we have to you are very right. I am trying to tell you again. I am not saying that this is efficient transfer. Yeah, it, it works. It works. Yeah, Absolutely. It and this is why I'm showing it. But we did measure the efficiency. Yeah. And efficiency is open to us. So, but we can get higher efficiency if we optimize, you are absolutely right, the size of the beam versus the size of the of the holographic optical micro Yeah, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you fabricate 3D material, usually do you use two photon absorption material? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is two photon photopolymerization. Oh, so you use absorption. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, are there more questions? If not, let us thank the speaker. So, basically, imagine you have black cells and you want to sort them. And you have other means of looking at them in fluorescence, uh, reflection, or whatever you happen to do. And here's your blood cell and it's boiling. And then you want to, you want to sort it different compartments, you have your microfluidic device, and then depending which way you want the cell to go, you turn your rotor on, and it will become your mic microsurgeon. Um, this is sort of a futuristic picture, we haven't done it yet, but it's totally doable, and you can imagine that you can combine it then with, um, with optical stretcher, where uh, Joachim Gluck is using it for looking at the elasticity of the red blood cells and so on. And that could be quite a lot of good to do.
Okay, um, what I want to finish off talking about is that you can also use um, uh, rotation. You, you, you can create rotation and then uh, with um, uh, of elongated objects in non-circular beams. So basically, what you can do is uh, something like this. That I take an elongated beam, or uh, elongated object, and I put elliptically shaped beam on it. And what should happen is that this elliptically shaped beam should align itself with the ellipticity of, of the, so elliptically shaped object should align itself with uh, elliptically shaped beam. And this has to do with field energy minimization, and uh, it's not due to polarization at all this time, uh, and, uh, but orbital angular momentum is involved here. And you can sort of understand it if I go back to it. This is no surprise to us, because if I have an object in electric field, it aligns itself, the dipole in electric field will align itself with the dipole. So it's pretty much what's happening here. This is the comparisons which you are doing all the time between particles and atoms, and I go and say between particles and dipoles. So this is not that surprising. Okay, and so I think I can take, I can take so this is just a, a, a evidence of that happening. So basically I can take spheroid and put it into elliptical spheroid with the axis of 4 uh, uh, to 1, and the elliptical beam with the ratio between elliptical axis 3 to 1, and this is numerical calculation shows you that I will have total, so we are plotting here total efficiency on those objects versus semi-minor uh, uh, axis. And you can see that I have spin angular momentum involved here and all predominantly orbital angular momentum involved here. And then I have a total. And then if I, if I so, so what happens is that if I change the axis out way, this is what will happen. I will have predominantly uh, spin angular momentum involved in here, and the total angular momentum will be given here, and orbital will change uh, uh, the sum. And so, if I were able to measure something like this, I would be able to see in each situation how much of spin angular momentum I have and how much orbital angular momentum I have. And so, if we look at that, so first of all, to convince you it happens, I have alignment of microscopic rods to elliptically polarized, elliptically shaped beam. So basically I have this rod which I showed you before, this was one of my original pictures, uh, and I put elliptical beam on it, and you can see that it, uh, that it rotates. And the interesting thing with this is that incident orbital angular momentum is zero. This is just an elongated beam. It's not, it's Gaussian beam, which I put through a slit. So I physically elongated it, okay? And so, and then I put it on this elongated object, and uh, it does rotate. So it tells me that out, outgoing orbital angular momentum must be non zero. So the question is, can I measure it? Now you might ask, why is she worrying us with measurement of orbital angular momentum? So basically, spin angular momentum, I showed you, can measure very easily, right? You just need to have transmitted light in your tweezers whatever you have been doing with it, and then you just look at left-handed and right-handed circle polarized component. You take the difference between them, you know, and you about orbital, uh, spin angular momentum. However, to do it with orbital angular momentum is much more difficult. So this is, this is evidence here of orbital angular momentum being produced, but now I want to measure it. Now I, why do I insist on measuring it? Because in all the things that I have been showing you up to now, apart from pure spin angular momentum, in all the machines and stuff, there was orbital and spin angular momentum involved. And if I really want to do a quantitative analysis of it all, I should be able to find a method of measuring orbital angular momentum as well. So that's what I'm after. So how can I measure orbital angular momentum? Well, uh, I can decompose uh, the beam which is coming out to ga into gauss like a beams of light. I can Fourier transfer, uh, reuse Fourier transfer recognition using hologram in Fourier plane. So we were talking about Fourier plane before, and where the holograms are and so on. So this is what I basically can do. So, so I can decompose the beams. So you can see that here I have a, 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 
the experimental uh, beams being produced. Uh, sorry, experimental beams being produced. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the good part of it all is that Laguerre beam modes of life are self Fourier transforms. So we can use that for analyzing. So the idea goes something like this. Imagine, uh, so first of all, I can use holograms to make gauss like beams of light, and we said that before. So basically, if I take my incoming beam as a, a gauss, Gaussian beam, I put it on a hologram, which is in this case 0, 2 phase hologram. Okay. Then, if the transmitted beam straight through, I will still have zeros order gauss like beam of light. So that would be Gaussian. And then I will have upwards, I will have zero plus two gauss like beam of light and zero minus two. That way, it's just like diffraction rating, right? Specific diffraction rating. Hopefully, no higher orders existing, which is not true. But let's, let's do this assumption, make this assumption for a moment. So now assume that I take gauss Lagarde zero minus plus two beam of light. Okay, so this is my incoming beam. I still take the same phase hologram. So this is phase hologram, which I call gauss Lagarde zero two. So if it were illuminated like before by Gaussian beam, I would get zero plus minus two. But now I am illuminating the same hologram by zero plus two. Okay, so then straight through the same order like before. So that means that straight through I will have gauss Lagier zero two. And in the first and minus first order, I will have going downwards, I will have Gaussian beam. And upwards it will be too high. So what it tells me is that if I had on the transmission through my instrument, gauss Lagarde 0 plus 2, and if I looked, if I put this hologram on the way and exactly aligned, if I saw images like this, then I can come go backwards and say, this is the beam I have. That means I can measure all the way I'm going to Irradiance at the center gives straight, straight, strength of a gauss Laguerre component, and those techniques are very popular in quantum information and quantum computation. Uh, some people question them, and some people say they are great. Okay, so um, so assume now that I have I was talking about elongated beam. So assume now that I have modeled the composition of incoming elliptical beam. So this is my elliptical beam. And this is, it is decomposed to 0, 2 mode of gauss Lagarde, Gaussian beam, and 0, minus 2. With reasonable approximation, okay? So, I have mirror symmetry scatter it is, it is coupled to plus minus delta L of, sorry, plus minus 2 of delta L. And that also means that top will be unbalanced, have unbalanced amplitude of zero plus minus two. Okay. So if I want to probe this method of measuring orbital angular momentum, we thought, oh, we are clever, we'll go under optical physics and do it. And it didn't work for a very long time, so we made a mock-up setup, macroscopic setup, to try to check that the method will work. So basically what I have is a laser, I make adjustable slit, which will let me make the beam more or less elongated. Then I put an iris here, and I put my face object here. So I have rotating glass plate instead of having this, this trying to trap the, uh, the uh, shadow glass. And then, so the light is being transmitted through this, and I want to see the orbital angular momentum of that light here. Okay. So what do I do? According to what I told you before, I have to put Gauss uh, Laguerre of 0, 2, or whatever it is we want to put in, in here, some lens, and rotating screen just to, rotating screen is just there for detection, because if I rotate screen, I don't see any speckle pattern, 
and then I put it into the camera. Okay? So this is my face plate. This is my face plate, and this is my elongated beam. Okay? And so now I'm trying to measure it. So as I said, if I have Gaussian beam, it goes through zero to plus minus zero to um, onto the road. So if it's Gaussian, I get Gaussian left here in zero order, minus plus two. If I take zero two, I get my Gaussian here, zero two, and zero four. And you can see that the middle part is getting bigger and bigger, and the ring is getting thinner and thinner. And then if I take elongated beam, you can see that if it's this type of elongated beam, that's reproduced here, and minus and plus two. And if it's now exposed to some sort of object, which is my elongated object, then you can see that those things change. So these are actually experimental results. But in this mock-up stuff, not under the microscope. So in principle it works, right? Because it changes the way we said, so we should be able to calculate it. And of course if I go the other way, those two should this should change the direction, and it does, and those should change the direction, and it does. So, in principle, it works very well. So we plot it, rod in elliptical beam, so we have our experiment, and our theory, and it all works very well. Right, we get, get the method for all the angular momentum measurement. And then we can look at the phase thickness of the rod. We change the phase thickness of the rod, and we look at the torque Efficiency. And we can see that the theory and experiment agree very well, so we found ourselves the method for, 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 for evaluating orbital angular momentum. And it's very large there. Um, so we can see that when we're looking at the alignment of rods in elliptically elliptical beam, we can see significant transfer of orbital angular momentum in this 0.8, measurable using holograms. Similar to techniques using quantum information uh, processing, spin significant for small objects, the spin are angular momentum, and still face very large challenges. What is it? When I start doing it in the microscope, it just doesn't work. It's very difficult to see clear pictures, like I'll go back to this, to see clear pictures like that under the microscope is very, very difficult. And one of the difficulties, I think we also can have from that one. Nothing works. Um, so one thing you can see here is that those, those, those images are really, really clear. And they have to be that clear to be able to measure anything from them. So in principle, the method is working. But as soon as you go through into high numerical aperture objective, then you are not actually looking at those images of the gauss like beams of light on the transmission in far field. You're looking at it in a focal region. And what's happening in focal region is slightly less clear. Okay, so I was showing you that before, that you can rotate things like that. So I'm showing you again that we can. But measuring all to angular momentum transfer here. So this is elongated rod in principle. I have gauss like S02. I should be able to measure all the angular momentum. Uh, but, uh, but, but it didn't work. So hang on, I, I showed you that too fast. I want to do that. Okay, sorry. No, I didn't show you that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so. This is too difficult. We don't know how to do it, so I'll skip measuring all the angular momentum and I'll go about it in sort of around the way, not straightforward way. So again, I can have rotation, so I'll summarize what I said. I can have rotation uh, using spin angular momentum. So for that, as we said, we need um, uh, biofringin particles and I can measure spin transfer, uh, angular momentum. That's easy. And we said that when I want to transfer over to one momentum, I can do it this way. And I show you my optical element or hologram or whatever. And uh, rod 
uh, sorry, cross, and I can rotate that. But in this case, as we said, orbital angular momentum is involved. So I can do it by having uh, the the the, the, uh, um, the Gauss Legier beams of light, or I can, on top of it, add to it, as we said before, circular polarized light. Okay, um, I didn't want that. Okay, so. I know how to rotate uh, elongated particles. I know how to rotate spherical particles which are biophagian. Now I can cheat a little bit and rotate voids in particles as though they were elongated objects. Okay. So this is what I do. I take my photopolymerization process. I'm trying to bring all this stuff together which I have been spending five hours to talk about. Anyway, so, so instead of having just a sphere, which is built out of uh, uh, resin, what I do now is that I create the sphere with a void in it. Okay, so this is a resin which has a particular refractive index. If I don't have a core in it, then there is a step in the refractive index. Right? And I can make that hole different sizes. So in principle, if I were to take um, a sphere made out of the resin and I would put it into my optical tweezers, it would not rotate because it's symmetrical and Gauss, Gaussian beam is symmetrical and it doesn't impact any uh, angular momentum. However, I showed you before that if I have elongated object, even with gauss lagier beam of light, because of shape bash engines, it will rotate. So now, everything is symmetric in the optical tweezers. This outside is symmetric, so it doesn't contribute to any rotation. But because the light is going through this hole here, and there is a step in the refractive index, then it acts as elongated object. And therefore, the whole sphere should rotate. So these are my spheres which I built. Okay, so you can see that they have. We can have them with different uh, void sizes. So overall, there are four microns, and um, and uh, uh, here it is. Here I can show you how to rotate. So basically, this is what I will want to do. I will want to have elongated object, but the surrounding of it kept in a in a spherical shell, so I can do my calculations very easily. And then I want to rotate it. And here it is. So you can see the change in the refractive index because the light is going through different refractive index and it's reflected in a different way. And you can see that it can rotate it So it rotates nicely. And now the question is, I'm transferring orbital angular momentum to it. Can I measure the orbital angular momentum? So there is a spin on this particle and all the Enough? Okay. So if I measure spin on this particle, that's not very difficult. So I look at the void diameter, or void diameter, and then here I look at the torque efficiency per photon. And you can see that I can measure, depending on the void diameter, I can measure how what is the torque efficiency. Uh, of the microsphere as a function of, of, of the void. Okay, so if I now want to measure orbital angular momentum, we know that the total angular momentum is composed of spin and orbital. Okay, so that's what we have to remember. So first of all, I will have steady rotation of this microscopic structure, and then I know that the total torque is equal to drag torque on the spherical particle of the void due to rotation in the liquid. If I have Newtonian liquid, uh, Newtonian liquid, liquid means it's, it's only, uh, we're talking about viscosity and not elasticity of the liquid, then it, then it will, the rotation rate can be easily determined and we know what it means. And the total torque then will be given by spin torque and orbital torque. And of course, total torque will be determined by some constant times uh, the rotation rate. And the rotation rate is always easy to determine. Right? 
Okay, so if I can determine, or now I can determine uh, orbital torque and C by measuring the spin torque and orbit or uh, the rotation rate for three different degrees of polarization. Left-handed, circularly polarized, right-handed, circularly polarized, and linearly polarized. Okay? So either I take normal gauss lagerbeam on by, I put it through this particle which has a void, I measure rotation rate. Then I put lambda over the fault plate before it enters the microscope, I measure the rotation rate. And then I put the lambda, I turn the lambda over the fault plate 90 degrees and I measure the rotation rate again. So here we plot it. So, uh, so this is just the rotation rate because this is linearly polarized line, and then I have plus minus linearly polarized line. So by fitting the curve to a linear function, we can find the orbital torque per photon, which is delta sigma omega, from the slope of this fit, uh, alpha, and the intercept, which is this intercept, with the y-axis. Um, omega zero as being delta sigma zero omega zero over alpha and we find that this orbital torque is 0.2 per photon 0.2 h bar per photon uh, so orbital efficiency orbital torque efficiency is 10 percent which is quite large similar to the spin torque the total orbital torque then is given by that much so that means that we have devised a method which will enable us under the microscope, under the conditions that we are working on, to determine both spin and orbital angle, which means the total characterization of the rotation under the optical this can be done, which means that I can now, knowing this, I can use that, that measurement to then characterize the liquids in which I am. And if they are not purely Newtonian, I'll find out from this that they are not, and then I have to do something about being able to look at the elasticity of the liquid as well. So total optical torque then can be plotted, and uh, these experimental values here for the total optical torque agree with the prediction predicted value within 10%. And you know, 10% for some of us would sound like rather large uncertainty. However, here, there are a lot of elements that we have to take care of and we don't know that well, and it's enough not to know the particle size of the, the structure that we produce well enough, uh, because it's such a st strong dependence of particle diameter, that 10% uh, in accuracy, we decided that it wasn't. Okay, so now we go, for the, the last little bit, to your question that you had, whether we could rotate things this way in normal optical physics. And the idea of this, this is the very last thing I want to talk about. The idea of this was, I was trying to show you this transduction of signal in the cell. So we had a flat cell, and then we came with the particle and we rotated it like this. Because we had tweezers coming from above, and the particle was only able to rotate like that because of our geometry. But often in biological situations, the, the, the cells are very flat, and to rotate something very close to the cell in the same z direction, is, z position is very difficult because they are too flat and the rotating objects are too big. So what you want to do is to rotate something like this on top of the pump. Okay then, so we said, oh, we can do this, that's not difficult at all. How do we do it? Well, our optically driven micro machines are perfect for that. So we build a dumbbell, which looks like this. So basically it has two bobbins here, and then it has this, this paddle wheel here in the middle. And then we, so we turn it around. So first of all, I show you the construction of it. So here it is, and it can be rotated. Not very fast, but it does rotate. So the idea here is that you trap, so your trap is coming this direction. Okay, so you have to turn at 90 degrees, okay? So there are two traps. I'm holding this fellow and this fellow in two optical traps, either from above or from below, it doesn't really matter. And then I'm coming with the third beam from underneath, 
and I am pushing on the paddles. So we are back to radiation pressure, to the very first slide that I showed you in my first out of four lectures. So basically, this will drive the paddle around and the two tweezers will hold it together. And that gives you an opportunity of moving it around. So with two tweezers, you can move it to any position over the cell, which can be as flat as you want it. It's three-dimensionally trapped, so therefore you can move it up and down in that direction and measure how much stress you are exerting on it. And then you can do all the measurements of, of the sort that I was describing before in combination with this construction here. And then you can, of course, combine it if it's in, on top of the cell. You can combine it with um, surface enhanced from an. You can combine it with FRET, you can combine it with other types of microscopy to probe the cell in itself and see what's happening with it when it's exposed to the stress. So here are our little toys. We make machine elements, we make little pillars, we make little crosses, and we have a lot of stuff to do, but of course all that wouldn't be possible without all the horror of students who work very hard from all over the world. Um, and this is Marta, whom you met the other day, who came to us from uh, Mexico, worked with us. Uh, this is my colleague, Norma Hagenberg. Timo Neumann, who is doing a lot of calculations. Here's our in-house chemist, who can show us how to functionalize our leads. Uh, and, and the PhD students here, former PhD student, who has done a lot of measurements of all the one you And here at Asave, uh, Vince Lowe. Uh, this is um, Marion Funk, who was with us for a year from Germany. And, yeah, and they do all this fantastic work that I can talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> are there some questions? And then we did try to make a kangaroo. <laughs> but it looks like a rat. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. In, in the beginning, you had some expressions for expressions for uh, well, for everything, uh, for yeah. force, for the pressure. Um, if we put colloidal particles in the liquid crystal material, and uh, then it will have different uh, 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 refractive index to different... Uh, what am I doing? I'm putting which particle to liquid uh, crystal? Silica particle. It will have different refractive index? Well, liquid crystal has different uh, refractive indices. In different directions? Yes, yeah. but particle, let's say, has normal anchoring. Yeah. Uh, so it will have uh, N parallel around. So my... Well, in the calculation, do we have to take parallel in all directions, or do we have parallel to what? Uh, refractive, refractive index parallel in the material, uh, or do we integrate parallel to the perpendicular? Or the Are you talking about liquid crystal geometry? Uh, I'm talking about. I'm not quite sure what you mean okay, by parallel it, in in, in polystyrene B. Okay, there's uh, one refractive. Index. A uh, liquid crystal has two yeah. refractive indices, so, and parallel and perpendicular. Yeah. Okay, if we put a particle with a silica particle, it has normal anchoring. So liquid crystal will be normal to the particle from mm -hmm. all directions. Mm -hmm. uh, then we want to move it. Uh, mm -hmm. So do we take into consideration and parallel in any case? We don't take perpendicular. Okay, well, or do I, we so I have never calculated anything about trapping in the, in the liquid which is anisotropic. Okay. Now, it is well known that if you, of course, if you take liquid crystal, a blob of liquid crystal, and put it into optical tweezers, the Gaussian thing, it will rotate. So this is another way of rotating. Mm -hmm. What will rotate? A liquid crystal because of the fact that it has two refractive indices. Ah, and, uh, and yes, it's like your... Uh, but by fringing. By fringing. Yes. But then what you are saying is, if I'm guessing right, mm -hmm. is if I have liquid crystal in which I'm trying to trap my particle, mm -hmm. 
will it align itself to a particular direction of the liquid crystal, depending on what sort of refractive index it has? Is that your question? No, no. Uh, in the, remember, I asked about the force. In the force, you have uh, yes. n, which yeah. is n is basically basically uh, n one minus n two. Relative refractive. Index, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and that's what I thought, okay, if we put uh, this particle into anisotropic material, yeah. what kind of n do we take? N1, N2, like, okay, N1 is a particle, N2 is it like I perpendicular? Don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. I think that uh, it's a quite complicated situation, so likely it will all depend on polarization of why that you use and many other things. Um, but maybe you could discuss this, you know, uh, after the lecture. Uh, are there more questions? More questions? If not, let us thank uh, Halina for a wonderful lecture.